Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Yu from UIUC, and uh, today I would like to introduce our work, Metadata Aware Document Contrastive Learning for Zero Text Classification. Uh, this is a joint work with researchers from UIUC, Microsoft, and UCLA. <clears throat> so let me first introduce the problem like background. Um, our task is multi-level text classification, that is, given a document, we would like to predict its relevant labels. Uh, these labels are predefined and the candidate set can be very large. For example, we may have more than 10,000 labels, and one document may be relevant to multiple labels. Uh, we give an example here. The document is a PubMed paper. We have its title and abstract, and we also show the relevant labels, which are essentially mesh terms. We can see this paper is related to lots of uh, labels from different aspects, such as uh, beta coronavirus, cardiovascular diseases, and um, humans, etc. Yeah. So uh, actually, there are there have been extensive studies on multi-level text classification, uh, but here we identify two key challenges that are less concerned in previous studies. The first one is weak supervision. So imagine if we have uh, enough annotated documents, for example, on PubMed, actually there are more than 30 million papers annotated in the way I show in the previous slide. So in that case, we can just use them as training data to train a multi-level text classifier. I show two related studies here, but there should be more. Yeah. Uh, the problem, uh, is like when we have a new label, for example, a new type of virus, uh, once it's just created, we don't have any training data for this label. A more challenging setting is when we switch to a new domain, we face a completely new label space. For example, we no longer care mesh terms. We want to like uh, extract lots of computer science terminologies from the corpus and uh, classify all the uh, documents to these uh, newly extracted terminologies by treating them as categories. In that case, we don't have any training data for any labels. So in that case, we may only know each label's name and some descriptive sentences also extracted from the corpus. Uh, still using this example, the beta coronavirus may be the canonical name of this label and we have a definition paragraph and maybe some other synonyms. So in this case, how to train a multi-level text classifier? without any training data. The second challenge is heterogeneous signals because documents on the web are beyond plain text sequences. They have metadata. For example, research papers may have authors, venue, and citation links. And also e-commerce reviews may be linked with uh, product IDs and uh, uh, reviewer IDs. Okay. So in this case, how to incorporate these additional signals? They are uh, very, uh, indicative, like uh, very strong category indi indicators, how to incorporate them in the uh, classifier training process. So based on these two challenges, we formally define our problem as follows. We have a set of labels. Each label has its name and definition. Uh, we have a large set of unlabeled documents associated with metadata that uh, can connect the documents together. Uh, I provide a natural view of papers with metadata here, you can see that maybe documents connected with each other, they share quite similar labels. Uh, actually, this inspires our framework design, which I will talk about later. Okay, we don't have any training data again. So desi the desired output is a multi-level text classifier. Uh, we would like the classifier to be inductive. So given some new documents, the classifier need to predict the relevant labels for each document. Okay, so now let me introduce our MICO framework. Here, MICO stands for Metadata Induced Contrastive Learning. Uh, let's start from a very simple uh, two stage framework, a retrieval and re ranking framework. So, for each document, a, a testing document, okay, we need to infer its uh, relevant labels. As I mentioned, the candidate pool, the original candidate pool is very large, larger than 10,000. Uh, so, in this case, we first use some discrete methods like uh, exact matching of BIM25 to retrieve a relatively small candidate pool, uh, usually less than 30 labels. And then we can use continuous methods like uh, word embedding or BERT to re-rank these labels. Uh, yeah, and those top ranked ones will be our final predictions. Okay, a pretty simple framework. Now the problem is how to instantiate these two stages. 
Uh, let's start from the retrieval stage. Actually, uh, still quite uh, um, simple heuristics here, exact matching plus BM25. By exact matching, we mean that we use label names to match document text. If a label is matched in a document, it will be a candidate for re-ranking. Uh, of course, we cannot rely on exact matching alone because one cannot expect all relevant labels uh, of a document explicitly appear in the text. So we need to allow partial lexical matching. Uh, here, still for each paper, we find it's relevant labels. So the query is paper title plus abstract. And the so-called item is the label name plus definition. So if the PM25 score between these two things uh, is larger than a certain threshold, we add the label to the candidate pool. So that's the retrieval stage. Um, how about the ranking stage? Still, we start from a simple model. Uh, let's check uh, what will happen for a naive bi-encoder model. First, we select a pre-chain language model, for example, BERT or CYBERT. We use CYBERT here because we're dealing with scientific papers. Uh, we use it to encode each document and each label. Yeah, so the label is represented by its name and description. And then we have a, we get a document embedding and a label embedding by taking the output vector of the CRS token. Uh, then we calculate the cosine similarity between them. So this is the final score. And then we can rank all the labels which already passed the, the, the retrieval stage. Okay. Uh, because uh, Cybert is already a pre-trained model, we can use it without any fine tuning, but in our experimental results, we find that if we don't do any fine tuning, the re-ranking stage cannot improve the F1 scores in comparison with using the retrieval stage only. So that means we need a better re-ranker. Currently, its contribution is zero. We need to fine tune it. Um, yeah, so the question becomes how to fine tune Cybert. Uh, before I talk about our own method, uh, let's first imagine if we could have some label documents, like we know some documents are related to uh, beta coronavirus, we can use these training samples to derive those relevant document label pairs to fine tune Cybert. Uh, in this case, both bind encoder and cross encoder become uh, applicable. For bind encoder, I already introduced it. Uh, if D and L are relevant, this score, this cosine similarity should be large. Also, we can use cross encoder. Instead of using two cyber, we use one and um, we just concatenate D and TL, feed it into BERT and uh, um, passing the CIS token into a linear layer to get to the final relevant, a relevant score between D and L. Okay, so uh, the problem is we do not have label data. Okay, so that's why we need contrastive learning here for fine tuning cyber. Uh, the idea of contrastive learning is instead of learning what is what, we, we try to learn what is similar with what. So uh, the, the key idea here is to create some similar document document pairs. I will talk about how to create them later, but let's first assume we can have some similar document document pairs. Then for bind coder, let's say D and D plus are similar and we randomly sample a D minus. Uh, then it, the, the idea is quite simple. We need to uh, maximize the score between D and D plus while minimizing the score between D and the, uh, uh, D minus, yeah. So we can use a contrastive loss here. Uh, it was originally proposed in this seminal work called SimClear. Yeah, and here tau, uh, tau is the uh, temperature hyperparameter. Okay. Um, so for crossing order, quite similar, okay? So we just have D, D plus and D minus. We concatenate D and D plus to calculate the score of the positive pair. And we concatenate D and D minus to calculate the score of the negative pair. The, the, the score of the positive one should be as large as possible. The score of the uh, negative pair should be as small as possible, okay? So the last question, how to create similar positive document document pairs, that becomes the key of our contrastive learning framework. Uh, let me first introduce some previous studies. They are purely based on text information. Uh, I list two things here, EDA and UDA, uh, both are seminal studies. For EDA, uh, it randomly inserts 
deletes, changes, or swaps some words to create an artificial document. For UDA, it performs back translation instead from English to French to, to English again, yeah, to create the artificial document. Actually, we tried these two methods, uh, manipulating the text only. However, they do not achieve satisfying performance. Actually, they are not guaranteed to outperform on fine tuned cybert. Uh, the reason could be that they were originally proposed for training data augmentation instead of contrastive learning. So the generated pairs are too easy for cyber in contrastive learning. You can imagine D and D plus may have 50% or 60% overlapping words. D minus is randomly sampled. So it's too easy for cyber to distinguish between D plus and D minus. So here comes our proposed technique called metadata induced contrastive learning which we use metadata to define the similarity between two documents. You can say maybe two documents sharing the same author or the same, same two authors are assumed to be similar. Or you can use references. If they are co-cited by the same paper, they are assumed to be similar. Actually, we can use the notion of metapaths and the metagraphs to define such similarity. Uh, I show some examples here, like. In this case, the, this red paper and blue paper, they share one common author, then uh, they are defined as similar, or they co-cite the same paper, or they have uh, they, they, they share one common author and the same venue, or they are co-cited by two papers. You can invent lots of different things. Actually, we try 10 different possibilities. So when you select a metapath or a metagraph and an architecture, by encoder or cross encoder. Actually, this combination fully instantiates our micro framework. Okay, so uh, now I will show the experimental results. Uh, we use two data sets, Microsoft Academic Graph CS and PubMed. They contain papers published uh, at top CS conferences and top medicine journals, respectively. Uh, you can see their label space are both, both of them have the label space larger than 10,000. And we use the matrix P at K and NDC G at K. So here are the results. Um, let's first compare within the zero shot methods. Actually, you can find that when we choose cross encoder and this metapass two papers co-citing one paper, uh, Michael actually significantly outperforms all zero shot baselines in most cases, uh, some exception here. Uh, the baselines include unfine-tuned cybert, uh, text-based contrastive learning methods, EDA and UDA, and citation-based contrastive learning methods, uh, uh, Spectre. Yeah. And then if we compare our method with some fully supervised method, like uh, the match uh, the model published in Triple Dub last year, we find that actually uh, on Max CS, Michael outperforms the match model with 50,000 label training data. On PubMed, it can outperform match with 10,000 training data. Okay, so uh, already uh, quite good performance because we don't use any training samples. Uh, so now let's switch to some new metrics. Uh, they are called propensity scored P at K and uh, propensity scored NDC G at K. Uh, abbreviated to PSP at K and PSN at K. The idea of these two metrics is that they want to give higher reward to more infrequent labels. Because if you can predict an infrequent label correctly, for example, Lagrangian SVM, you'll get a higher reward than you predict a frequent label, for example, computer science. This is intuitive because those inf if the label is infrequent, it should carry more information according to the information theory. And uh, the reward here, I, I will not dive into mathematical details here, but it is negatively correlated with the frequency of the label in the, chain, uh, in the data set. So we use some settings. Uh, those settings are the same as previous studies. Um, if we use P, uh, PSP at K and PSN at K, uh, actually the results are here. Now Michael is on par with the supervised match model with 100,000 to 200,000 label training data. Remember when we use P at K, uh, we can just beat 10,000 to 50,000. So that means labels predicted 
predicted by Michael are much more infrequent, or in other words, carry more information than labels predicted by the supervised match model. Um, I also showed the average reward here. You can see a large gap between these two groups of numbers. Okay, so in previous slides, I only showed the result of some citation-based uh, uh, metapass. Now I show the complete list of all the 10 possibilities. And you can find that all metapaths and metagraphs used in Michael, except paper venue paper, can improve the classification performance upon unfine-tuned Cybert. Uh, this indicates the generalizability of our framework. For paper venue paper, actually, it performs not so well because venue is too weak to distinguish between uh, those two fine green labels. So actually, we have some mathematical explanation uh, on like what kind of metapaths may perform well in our micro framework. Uh, second, we find that cross encoder models perform better than their bi encoder counterparts in most cases. So better to choose cross encoder. Um, to conclude our work, uh, we propose a zero shot multi level text classification framework uh, utilizing document metadata. We do not require any training data for any labels. We only rely on label surface names and descriptions. And we propose Michael, uh, different from previous uh, text-based contrastive learning methods, we exploit metadata information to produce contrastive learning pairs. Uh, finally, we uh, beat uh, those zero-shot baselines and is on par with the supervised match model trained on 10,000 to 200,000 label documents, depending on which metric we are using. Uh, yeah, so our data sets and code are already on GitHub. Um, that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thanks, you for the uh, super interesting and clear talk. Um, and I'll, with that, I'll open for any questions on chat or on mute, whatever works. Um, and just to give people some time to type or think, um, I'll start off with a simple question. Um, that uh, you said that fine tuning Cybert uh, on uh, positive example generated using other baselines was not working out. Um, but did you investigate uh, finding smarter negative samples in the sense uh, that looking at this similar sort of baselines for positive samples, but doing smarter negatives for contrastive learning? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you very much for asking this. Actually, we tried two strategies. Uh, the first one is like if say A cites B, B cites C, but A does not cite C, then we treat A, B as the positive pair and A, C as the negative pair. That's our first trial. The second trial is we just find those, uh, we, those like, uh, uh, um, how to say documents very close to B in the embedding space, in the BERT embedding space. Um, actually, both trials failed. So finally, we just used um, the random sample, random uh, negative sample. Uh, we are also trying to find some more uh, challenging negative samples. In that case, maybe uh, the contrastive learning training process will converge slower and uh, to achieve better performance because currently actually it converges in just several epochs. Yeah. Cool, awesome. Thanks for sharing that information. Um, I saw that there were two raised hands, uh, probably we'll go in order of the raising them first. So Victor, probably you can unmute. Yeah, thanks. Uh, gr thanks for the presentation. Two, two things. One, I saw you have a GitHub link in the last slide. Could you show it again? Thanks. Okay. And the second one um, was, so this relies heavily on this network of uh, articles that you presented. So mm -hmm. the yeah, do you have any measure of how clustered are the labels in this network? So like two nodes, which are, I don't know, uh, two papers that are 50 nodes apart, if such a thing exists, like very far, is it more likely that they have very different labels? Um, do you have any measure of this clustering of the labels in the node, in the graph? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, sorry, we haven't done that, like counting or statistics. 
uh, yeah, we have some mathematical derivation, and the the the, the results is I, is exactly the same as what you mentioned. Actually, the performance of the contrastive learning relies heavily on uh, like two nodes linked by a metapass or metagraph. How much how, how how much overlap they do share in in the label space, uh, but we don't uh, we haven't counted those statistics. Uh, sorry about that. We we can do it later. Thank you for the suggestions. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the question and the answer. Uh, next, I think Yuyan has a question. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have two questions. Uh, first is I think you listed like four possible definitions of a uh, meta pass there. So I wonder, have you tried like using all of them in one single model in, as the contrastive loss? And second question is, uh, in experiments, I think you compared uh, like the contrastive loss with the label data. I wonder, have you also compared with on top of the label training data? Can this additional contrastive loss further improve uh, the, the performance by adding additional loss to the label training? Do I make sense? Uh, sure, sure. OK. So uh, for the first question, yes, we did do that experiment. Uh, the result is that it's not quite stable. When we combine those top performing metapaths and metagraphs, the combination may outperform all the models using just one metapath, but sometimes it may just achieve the average performance of those uh, top performing uh, models. The reason could be that different metapaths actually, they have conflict semantics, you know, maybe two papers judged as similar by the first metapass may be judged as dissimilar by the second metapass. And those like a mixture of uh, one, a, a pair of papers may be judged as similar and dissimilar at the same time. So that will confuse the, the model. Uh, yeah, but it, it may happen, it may not happen. So sometimes it can beat all the models using just one single metapass. Uh, for your second question, uh, we haven't tried that. Uh, the reason is that match is not a bind coder or cross encoder model. It's a, because when you do classification for fully supervised model, it's just the last layer. You have, say, 10,000 labels. It has 10,000 entries, output a 10,000 dimensional vector. So uh, we cannot use contrastive learning here, but uh, you're right, if we use some supervised model, like supervised Michael, uh, sorry, supervised cross encoder, what will happen? It will be interesting to explore. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I have one small follow up for your first uh, point. So you're mm -hmm. saying that if, say, we use uh, MetaPass A or MetaPass B uh, only in the contrastive loss, both would outperform, say, some label training data. But if we combine them, like either A or B, as the contrastive loss definition, then it will not necessarily outperform the label training data. Uh, it will still outperform, but it's it cannot beat both, like just using I the see. first or just using the second. It's like the average of those two. It cannot beat the maximum of those two. Uh -huh. I see, I see. Thanks for clarifying. 